Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to be here and to see all of you. I have uh, been in Bolzano many times, but I have never been in this Alba Magna, and it's a beautiful room, and it's it's great to be with you tonight. Um, actually, my wife and I came to Bolzano a long time ago. We became members of CHI, the Club Alpino d'Italiano, in the, in the 70s, and we went walking in the mountains, and we brought our children walking in the mountains, and so it is great to be back here with you tonight. I'm going to talk about, let's see how we're, I'm going to do this. How about if I move over to this microphone, is that going to work? Is that going to work all right? Yeah, okay. I'm going to talk about the topic of this conference, climate change and sustainability, and but I'm going to talk about it primarily from an economic and a finance point of view, uh, and uh, we are really indebted to uh, Professor uh, uh, Kapainer for a, a great survey of what the scientific evidence looks like, and let's see, is this um, Maybe you have to switch it off. I need to switch it on. Yeah, I think so. Ah, yeah. Now there we go. Okay. Works now. Something happened. That was good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, just summary: the Earth is warming. We're learning that. Human activities are the primary cause. We are distorting the natural carbon cycle by emitting more CO2 and other greenhouse gases than the planet can absorb. Where do they come from? They come from ancient history of the Earth, where, where coal and gas were, were incorporated in the, in the rock structure, and we're going through efforts to pull it out and put it back in the atmosphere, and that's what is contributing to this increase in CO2. What's the consequence? Well, not only are we talking about rising temperature, which used to be sort of the thing we we're worried about, but along with the rise in temperature come so many other effects that we are seeing. We're seeing storms and floods in some areas, droughts in others, wildfires in great vast forests of this planet. And I think we've only seen the beginning of what happens when the climate changes. We are adjusted to the climate the way it is, but when it changes, we're going to be out of adjustment. The problem is the economic costs are very difficult to measure, and it's more likely that the damages we see now, which are quite serious, are going to be small compared to the damages that we can expect in the distant, distant future. So the question really is, what is the cause and what should be done? Um, so, the information that we saw just from uh, uh, the president's speech was very clear about the CO2 buildup that we've seen. I'm an econometrician and I'm interested in the data, and so I'm going to show you a, a very uh, concise way of seeing a whole bunch of data on CO2. So let me tell you what's gonna, what I'm going to show you. This is a video that's coming up. Here's, uh, okay, how do I turn this on? Was what was needed. Huh? Oops. 
Okay, so here is a little map of the world, and what's on this map are measurement stations. So the one on the bottom is in Antarctica, and the one that's in red is the famous Mauna Loa uh, carbon CO2 observatory on, uh, on the highest mountain in Hawaii. And then there are other circles here, which are other measurement stations. And on the bottom axis, we go from uh, 90 degrees south to 90 degrees north. Here's the equator. So here is the measurement in Antarctica. Here's the measurement in Hawaii. And here's other dots on here. There's a little clock here that starts in 1979 and it's going to go around and around as it measures the CO2 at these different sites over time. And we're going to see on the right hand side here, it starts in 1979 and it goes up to the present and this is the concentration of CO2. And this, all these measurements will be continually updated as the time goes along. So let's start this video and we'll see what happens, okay? Can you uh, press the go button or maybe if I press it, it'll go, I don't know. Nope. Uh, can can you make it make it go? You need to press the enter key, I think. build up all this suspense. <laughs> That's what. Okay, now you see measurement. The clock is going around here and you can see that the northern hemisphere, the CO2 is much more variable than it is in Antarctica. And you see this thing floating up and down. And that makes these cycles, which are actually the, the seasonal cycles that have to do with vegetation. The peaks are in something like February or March before the photosynthesis begins. And when photosynthesis begins, it takes CO2 out of the air and it gets better so that we have little cycles. Antarctica, there is a tiny cycle, but it's the opposite. And what you see is that there, behind all these cycles is a trend. And this trend is inexorable. And this was the trend that uh, Professor uh, Toppinger uh, showed. And you see we're getting more and more measurement stations here. And that there's a lot of noise, but the whole thing is not noisy. It's inexorable as it goes. And now we've crossed the 400 parts per million, but we'd like to go back in history. And she showed how you can use ice cores and tree rings. And you can see here we're going back to 1800, 1700, 1000, and it keeps going. Back in time, we now see 400 years before Christ, 10,000 years before Christ, 20,000, and this, these oscillations sort of continue back here, and it goes back and back in time. And we're approaching a million years before the birth of Christ, and you can see this whole graph is way below what we see today. And this is why it's so urgent that we do something about this. Um, I think it's easy to say there are natural phenomena going on, but what we're seeing now is much more extreme than anything we've seen for the last million years. 
There were periods even older than that when CO2 concentrations were high, but those were from natural causes and they took much longer. Each high period and low period were much slower. So although we may think this is happening solely in geologic time, it's happening very fast. And if we're going to do anything to stop it, we need to do it quickly. So that's that's my little uh, piece of science. So let's talk about economics now. Can we go back to the slides? Okay, so what is the cause and what do we do about it? So economists have an easy answer for this. It's called externalities, that there is free emission of greenhouse gases. There is no charge for emitting greenhouse gases. There is a charge for everything else, but no charge for emitting greenhouse gases. And yet there are costs imposed on other, other, all the other agents in the world in a way. All these damages are being imposed on other people by our free emission of, of greenhouse gases. The private market can't really solve this problem because of what's called free riders. And a free rider is the fact that if we all in this room decide we're going to stop emitting as many greenhouse gases, how do we know that each other is really doing this? It's so easy to say, well, if they're all doing it, it'll stop and I can just, I can continue to, to uh, run my air conditioner or burn my, uh, my natural gas heater. I don't have to freeze in my apartment or whatever. So the free rider problem is a really serious issue. And so economists think that there is a very natural solution, which is to put a price on carbon emissions. And actually, Europe is quite good about doing this. You've put together a, a, a cap, cap and trade system, which covers most, or I think a large fraction of stationary emissions. Um, it doesn't cover all the emissions by, by any stretch, but it covers a lot of them. And it's uh, part of the government process as to how strict these emissions restrictions will be, but um, the U.S. is way behind in doing that. We have a, uh, a system in California and a very small system in New England, both of which have much lower prices of emissions than in uh, Europe, but there are lots of plans in countries all over the world to put together emissions trading systems and they're moving a little slowly because it's pretty hard to convince people that this is really a real problem that they have to solve and that's why we show a picture sort of like what i did because it really is a problem that i think we need to solve so if we have a price on carbon, that is going to do two things. It's going to encourage us to emit less, but it's also going to spur research on carbon capture, efficient technologies, renewable energy sources, and all vast new technologies, which are going to be a great uh, boon to our society. Uh, when, when the emissions are, are priced. Um, as I said, it could be a tax on carbon, it could be a cap and trade system, and altogether what we want to do is we want to, the reason these systems are, are proposed is because 
They give each economic agent a chance to decide what's the most profitable way to reduce my emissions. I don't, the government doesn't have to answer the question of which things are green and which things are brown, which costs can be passed on to customers and which ones can't. The market can do that and it does it. So it's presumably the most efficient and inexpensive way of solving this problem. That's the economist answer. Not everyone agrees with the economist answer. And there are lots of good reasons for not agreeing with the economist answer because maybe the world doesn't work the way economists think it does. But I, I'll leave that as a, as a topic we could, uh, we could obviously discuss. So one of the problems of implementing this is what is the right price of carbon? What we mean by the right price of carbon is the social cost of carbon, and the social cost of carbon is designed to be a way to measure all these damages we're talking about. You'd like to know if we emit one ton more of greenhouse gases, CO2 equivalent, how much does that increase the cost in the future? But not only the short run in the future, but also the long run in the future. And then those damages, those incremental damages need to be discounted back to the present. Now, this is exactly the way a businessman would think about an investment. You know, you put in a dollar of an investment. What do you expect to get back and how long does it take you to get it? But this is a, actually a harder problem, partly because it's pretty hard to measure the damages. All the science that we saw doesn't really tell us what the damages are. And the economic models that are designed to give us the estimates of the damages are in their infancy. There are, there are not, there are a great many assumptions in there which really are untested. And it's not surprising they're untested because we've never been here before. So it's pretty hard task to try to figure out what these damages are gonna be. It's partly a problem because the damages are so, some of them are so far in the future, and the biggest ones are probably far in the future. And therefore, it's important to figure out what the discount rate is. And the discount rate is very controversial because if it's a, a high number, then the distant future doesn't matter much. And if it's a small number, then you have to make this calculation into maybe past 2100, I mean, into the next century. And that's, if you think it's hard to do it 10 years in the future, it's really hard to do it a century in the future. So the right discount, the right social cost of carbon is a big problem. And it's easy to say, we don't know what the answer is, but that doesn't mean zero is the best guess. That's where we are right now at zero. So the fact that we can't measure the social cost of carbon is not really an excuse for setting it to zero. It might be that we should set it at some arbitrary number and then adjust it as we get better and better estimates. And that's probably not a bad idea. An alternative, which is incorporated in the Paris Accord is really to say, we don't know what the price of carbon really ought to be, but let's try to keep the pathway to, to one and a half degrees centigrade. And that means getting the entire planet to net zero by something like 2050. So this is like a quantity restriction rather than a price restriction. I think it's the way the world is likely to go, but there are a lot of dilemmas in how to do that. And I don't think it can be voluntary because the same free rider problem is going to be there for a net zero of 2050 as there is for a voluntary carbon tax. We can talk about two ways to improve to reduce damages. 
One way we call adaptation, and one way we call mitigation. Adaptation is relatively uncontroversial, but it can be very expensive. It's how do you change what you're doing to take some of the sting out of the climate change? Do you plant different crops? Do you build a seawall? Do you air condition places that never needed it before? And all these sorts of things. So you can and analyze that from just a cost benefit point of view, from a personal point of view, but it does nothing to solve the climate change, it just reduces the damages. What you really need to do if you want to stop climate change is mitigation. And mitigation is really what we're talking about when we're trying to reduce emissions. So mitigation is our personal choice as to what's the best way to deal with climate change? We might just all try to adapt and it gets hotter and hotter and we're adapting and adapting and adapting. Or we should decide we want to mitigate climate change and that is a conscious decision to do something which costs us today but is better in the long run. When we talk about the risks of climate change, we often think about two risks which are tied to these two solutions. One is the physical risk of all these storms and droughts and everything. And the other is the transition risk. And the transition risk is the one that we pay most attention to probably because we are really trying to shift our production to more renewable energy lower carbon emissions and so forth. That is a transition risk and that imposes a risk which is a risk on some companies much more severe than a risk on other companies. And so transition risk is not balanced across the economy and there are winners and losers from transition risk. That makes it pretty hard to get it done. And yet, if we really want to mitigate this problem, we're going to expose ourselves to transition risk and that's what's, that's what's uh, controversial. So what do investors do now? Okay, we've set up the stage. What do investors choose to do? Well, one thing they might do would just be to include as much information about every company they put in their portfolio as possible, including climate information. That's not very controversial. Another thing they might do is to say, I think the market has a benign view of climate change and therefore I want to invest so that when climate change really materializes, my portfolio goes up. That's taking a view. A similar idea is not to take a view, but to say, I would like a portfolio that does especially well if the climate is worse than the market thinks it is. But if the climate becomes not as bad as the market thinks it is, then my portfolio is going to underperform. This is called a hedge portfolio. And a hedge portfolio is a natural thing to do to reduce the risk. If you have, there's risk that all these disasters are going to be really bad. Well, if they're, that happens, maybe that's when you'd like your portfolio to outperform. So there's a lot of interest now in how do you construct hedge portfolios and what should they actually include? What should they look like? Finally, there are investors who are less concerned about performance, they're more concerned about impact. They don't maybe care whether their portfolio outperforms or underperforms, but they want to make sure that they accomplish some social goal with their, with their investments. Uh, okay. So what's the, what's the economic or finance theory about this? Well, if you have a portfolio which is designed to be long, companies that are going to do 
well when the, if the climate is bad and short companies that are not prepared for climate change, that's going to be a risk reducing portfolio. It's going to reduce your risk. If it reduces your risk, it's sort of like a kind of insurance. And as usual, we have to pay for insurance. So you would expect a portfolio, a hedge portfolio like this to actually perform a little bit less well than the market. We say it's got a negative alpha or it underperforms the market. Most money managers feel like their clients want to be green and socially responsible in their investments, but they really don't like the idea that there's going to be underperformance associated with that. That's a tough sell. Fortunately, there's another side of this, which is if there is news that the climate is getting worse, then this hedge portfolio is going to have the long positions go up in value. Those are the renewable energy kinds of positions. They'll have the short positions, which are the fossil energy, go down in value, and this portfolio will be repriced and have a positive return as a result of this news. So if, in fact, there is a lot of bad news about the climate, a hedge portfolio will actually outperform the market, which it's not clear whether you should be happy about that or not, but it's what, what, what will happen. So if, if you as an investment advisor tell your clients that you're going to make money investing sustainably, kind of what that really means is that the climate is going to get worse than we now see the markets pricing. So we follow, uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, show you a little bit of the research we're doing at the Volatility and Risk Institute uh, on, on climate change. It's, um, it's something that we like to share with other people. We, uh, we collaborate with a lot of institutions and I think if, if, uh, if there is a, a climate institute here in Bolzano, this is something that we would, we would uh, be happy to join with. Uh, so we follow publicly available funds that are, have a climate objective. All sorts of funds, 178 of them. And every day we put together a table sort of like this, which looks at the alphas from, from uh, a little regression, which looks either one year, three year, five year, exponentially weighted or, or total time period uh, performance of each of these funds. And if you look at the average over all the funds, it's got a positive alpha, one and a half percent annualized alpha. So it's not very big at this point in time. Um, if you look over longer periods, it's negative, more or less the way we said at the beginning. It turns out that the, of the various types of sustainable funds, these sustainable sector funds have actually been doing pretty well. And I should say that this alpha has been dropping this year. It was very strong last year, but uh, it's now been dropping. So how do you build a hedge portfolio? Well, you use ESG data. One way to do it is to use data on the firms, on their environment, their society, and their social and uh, governance factors, three factors. Lots of vendors will sell you data on this. Lots of portfolio managers say they use it to form their portfolios. But what are they really doing? It isn't really clear what these portfolio managers are actually doing or whether the result really is a green portfolio. We've coined the word greenwashing and, and uh, it's pretty hard to figure out what is really supposed to happen. So an alternative is to build 
a model which uses something which is not based on that kind of data. For example, the emission certificates traded in the carbon exchanges around the world actually are financial assets, and you can put these into a portfolio. And there's an ETF now that we helped bring to market called KRBN, which is actually just consists of futures in the a global set of carbon exchanges. And that, it turns out, has had a great year. Um, but really what I want to talk about is a statistical approach to figuring out what would a green portfolio really do. And I've already given you the hint. What a green portfolio should do is it should appreciate when there's news about the climate. But we have a negative alpha maybe on the rest of the time. So that's some work. Here's our family camping trip a few years ago when there was still snow in the mountains. Um, so we are, I'm going to show you a, uh, two hedge portfolios, one of which we call the stranded asset portfolio, which is actually proposed by Bob Litterman of uh, Kepos Capital. Uh, it basically is long the spider SPY, Standard Poor's 500, and short 70% of a coal ETF, which is a, just made up of coal companies, and 30% of the XLE, which is an energy ETF. So this is a portfolio, a very simple portfolio, which basically is short fossil fuel energy and long the rest of the, the market. So we're going to call that a stranded asset portfolio and hope that it reflects transition risks. Secondly, we're going to construct a second portfolio, which is made up of all these 178 publicly available portfolios, but we want to be able to pick the best of them. We're going to pick the best of them by trying to find which ones respond to news about the climate. So we have a tech based news source and we have uh, several factors pricing factors pharma french factors and an oil factor as well as the stranded asset factor and we're going to look at once you take out those factors which funds are most correlated with the news you put those into a portfolio you reduce the variance as much as you can and you hold this portfolio for a month and then we rebalance it and hold it for another month and so forth. Okay, so that that's what this uh, portfolio is. I'm gonna call it the Climate Efficient Factor Mimicking Portfolio or CEP. And this is what it looks like at the moment. This is going to be on VLAB, so you'll be able to see it over time and what's in it. Um, if you, I don't know whether you like look at regressions or not. Of course, I'm an econometrician, so I like to look at them, but you know, nobody else really does. But let me just tell you one thing to look at. So here is, this is the news series. And so now this is an out of sample regression, all these one month holding periods that are all out of sample, regressed on the HML, SMB and the market factors, the stranded asset portfolio and oil portfolio, and here's the coefficient on the news. And you can see it's got a T-statistic of 3.9. This looks like it's quite significant. That's kind of the evidence we've been looking for. Here is uh, its alpha, which is if you take out the, the news and put in just a constant term, then run the same thing, subtracting the, the risk-free rate, you get an alpha. This turns out to be 6% since on date from uh, 2001 to 2021. So, okay, it's, you know, this process has gotten us a little bit of a positive alpha by adjusting the, which funds are in there over time. And it's very investable. Oops. Um, is it really a climate hedge portfolio? I say yes, because it's correlated with the news. Is it really dynamic? Yes, because it's changing over time. Is it really minimum variance? 
Well, it is, but uh, it's too complicated to tell you why. Is it a physical risk factor? Well, I think with physical risk is pretty hard to price. And none of these portfolios, 178 portfolios, has the word physical risk in it. Most financial advisors don't know how to price physical risk. And I would say, I don't know how to fight price physical risk either. I don't know whether to price wildfires or sea level rise or any of these things. Because you've got to know location. And in the stock market, it's kind of, there's a headquarters and then there's a supply chain and then there are places where you manufacture something. Which of these is exposed to physical risk and how exposed is it? It's pretty complicated. But if this seems like a job that Wall Street is working on. It is a job that Wall Street is working on. I know they're working on it. If they can figure it out, then some of these 178 funds are likely to outperform. And so I think there's a chance we're going to be getting physical risk out of this sooner or later by just the fact that there is so much money looking for better and better ways to hedge climate change. Okay, how did it do last year? It did great. I mean, we had a, uh, an alpha of 70% in 2020. The pandemic was great for sustainability. It's not a shock, actually, because we stopped driving, we, we learned how to Zoom, we don't fly. All these things that are reducing our fossil fuel emissions contributed. Uh, Wall Street also thinks sustainability uses this year for uh, justifying sustainability. So, we now have these two climate factors. Possibly there are other climate factors. Possibly they're not really that good a factor. What would you do with them? Well, one thing you might do is be investing them. You know, I mean, this, these, these are both investable. Or you might want to invest in things that have a high beta on these, that is, that are correlated with them because they would have similar performance. It might be you want to measure risk by looking at the, at the volatility of these, these factors, because that tells you how much news there is about the climate as, as time goes along. Or maybe you want to look at the beta of banks to see how exposed each bank is to these kinds of climate factors. So this is actually work we are now doing. We're doing stress testing of banks with these climate factors. We're looking at whether the banks would go have stock prices which fall dramatically if these climate risk factors were to get bad. And it turns out that the betas on these risk factors are not constant over time, just like the factors themselves don't have constant ingredients. And so over time, the betas have been going up and down and so forth. But more recently, they've been going up. Let me show you a, a couple of pictures. Uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly. So here's a picture of, of one, two, three, four, five, about 10 of the largest US banks. And this is the beta. So this tells you how sensitive its stock price is to this is the stranded asset portfolio. So it's kind of how much fossil fuel exposure do these banks have in their portfolios, in their loan portfolios. And you can see zero is kind of in the middle here. And so it isn't that clear that there is a lot of exposure here. However, when you get back here at the end, these are all going up at the end. And so they're the exposure looks positive toward the end of the sample period. This combination of things, it could be that their, their holding portfolio has changed. It could be that the market is pricing climate risk more 
importantly uh, than it did before. Here's the same thing for UK banks, and you can see zero is a lot lower for these banks. So UK banks all look like they've got some, uh, some exposure. Uh, we've done this for a lot of other countries as well. And the question is, are we really getting something that's economically important or interpretable? Well, th there is some data on active gas and oil uh, loans comes from uh, regulatory filings. And if you look at the plot at the end of the sample period for the, these banks, and you look, compare that with the climate data at the end of the sample, you see there is actually a positive slope here, suggesting that the banks that have more exposure will have a higher beta. And so we're, we're getting, we're talking about this to a lot of central banks around the world and there is uh, a, a lot of interest in this because they're all trying to figure out how should we do an evaluation of the climate sensitivity of, of banks and is this something we should worry about or not and I mean I think what we see here is that it's not probably a big effect at this point but if we're going to do something strong about transition risk, it could be uh, bigger in the future too. So let me close with a picture of three of my grandsons who were looking out over this nice peaceful lake, wondering what's in their future. This next generation is pretty worried about what we're giving them. And so I, I'm not quite sure how deeply they've thought about this question, but certainly there, a, a lot of young people were sort of saying, you know, it doesn't pay to vote. We don't have to do this. It isn't interesting. Um, but if we had a solution, they'd be a lot happier. Thank <laughs> you.